let's just start with introductions. Um, Christiana, we already know you from the introduction, but just in case somebody missed that, um, just just a brief introduction of yourself and your role. Yeah, I'm a German qualified real estate lawyer with 13 years of experience now, um, in addition to focusing on real estate transactional and asset management work, I've been advising on sustainability or now ESG matters since 2012. Um, I'm co-leader of the German real estate um, legal practice at PwC, and since last year, in November, I'm quite honored. Um, I got the opportunity to also lead the EMEA real estate ESG team at PwC, comprising mm -hmm. comprising of all the different service lines, which is consultants, tax advisors, valuation, and also lawyers. Great, thanks very much, Carlin. I'm Carlin O'Brien. I'm from Son Group. I'm the global head of ESG. So, in addition to looking at our own carbon footprint, our ESG ratings internally. Uh, as a PRI signatory, I also look at what our clients need on ESG. Uh, we're an administrator to many different funds, including real estate, uh, hedge funds, private debt and private equity. So really to assist them in, in what they need from ESG and also the new regulations. Great. Thanks very much. Olga. I'm a head in real estate and infrastructure practice here in Ukraine. I'm a lawyer with more than 20 years of experience. Besides that, I'm wearing another hat. It's like I'm uh, I'm advisor to Kiev City Mayor on strategic development, and uh, I'm also leading PwC initiatives on the legal and regulatory developments in all over Ukraine with Ukrainian government. Basically, uh, tomorrow we are going to have discussions together with European Business Association, particularly on ESG issues implementation. So uh, this conference is is at the right time. I'm making a lot of notes over here. Great, thanks very much, Olga. Maybe let's just start with you, Christiana, just in terms of, of, of strategies around that. Just 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 pick up a little bit the EU taxonomy. Yes, you just said. So we've heard a, talked a lot about strategies today and how you need to look at the market trends, need to position yourself. But we also heard today it's about regulation. So no one can avoid ESG anymore. It's not mandatory anymore. And I think key to that is the EU regulation. And um, yeah, today is as said before, it's a milestone day with the um, financial disclosure regulation um, coming into force, um, at least to a large extent. And this regulation, which is basically about disclosure, it, this is further supplemented by the EU taxonomy. And the EU taxonomy became um, effective last year in, in summer. And it's basically, from a legal point of view, I, I really, really like it. It's the first global, it's a regulatory framework really defining when an economic activity can be regarded as um, sustainable. So it puts an end to greenwashing um, and it's, it's a really yeah, a complex system and it's, it's aiming to promote um, six environmental targets. The first ones are climate um, change mitigation and climate change adaptation. And then it's also about um, yeah, the sustainable use of um, of water and marine resources, it's about um, circular economy, it's about pollution prevention and um, the protection of biodiversity. So this is really a, a long ongoing regulatory process which has just started. And yeah, as I said before, it puts an end to greenwashing. It gives, gives a lot of guidance, but there's also several things which need to keep in mind because um, there we will see further um, delegated act here in the future um, specifying these criteria and which will also come on to um, technical experts groups it will further be defined by national regulation as well so um, anybody is, is advised to watch that more closely Colleen, just you you've obviously seen this you're, you're sitting in South Africa which I don't think we mentioned at the beginning which is useful to know you're looking at it from a global perspective I suppose where do you see this at the moment in terms of of regulation particularly looking at Europe within that global perspective? How we see it, it's not really that uh, the regulations are coming in to force every single fund out there to, to become an ESG fund. It really uh, sets out um, definitions and, and targets out there if someone claims to do something and someone else claims the same thing that they are really doing it on the same basis. So really to, to um, 
unify what is meant when someone says I support uh, um, climate change. So every fund uses the same jargon. And then also the metrics that will follow in the future that when people then do disclose that everyone also does it um, on the same basis. So, so funds can start to be compared because um, I think the, the biggest um, deterrent for investors at the moment is that it is so um, absolutely not homogenous um, out there and you can't compare funds with each other. So the, the regulations are really there to, to uh, flatten the fields. And um, like Christiana was saying, avoid greenwashing. If someone says they're doing it, that they are indeed doing it. And it's not really forcing f uh, everyone to become an ESG fund. Um, and you shouldn't really say you are doing something that you're not. So it's uh, some of our clients in, in implementing the, the regulations were asking, well, should they go and amend their agreements in order to, to say that they are doing these things? And we said that that's absolutely not the first step. The first step is really if you are making claims that you do it on, on the taxonomy and using the same definitions. Um, and Olga, how do you see that? Um, because obviously, in terms of emerging markets, how easy is it to bring in a number of these these regulations? How how quickly can the market actually bring these things on board? Thank you, Carly, and uh, for raising the issue of unification. I will speak about Ukraine. We are not directly affected by EU regulation. So we are affected somehow because of uh, subsidiaries of European countries operating in Ukraine, because of Ukrainian companies listed in uh, European stock exchanges uh, because of uh, Ukrainian companies supplying to Europe. Somehow these regulations affect our uh, corporations and companies, but nevertheless, we have uh, also some Ukrainian legislation which is not completely in line with is ESG requirements at the moment. Nevertheless, speaking about emerging markets uh, like Ukraine, we have disadvantages, like uh, we um, did not have of development of ESG strategies for a while, but at the same time we have advantage because we can test all the legal and regulatory changes on the other countries and implement only the best practices. Uh, from practical perspective, uh, you know, I introduced myself as a real estate lawyer with expertise over 20 years. Uh, I would a little bit discuss uh, the general topic of this panel. Uh, we are uh, speaking about legal and regulatory changes which are driving ESG initiatives. I would speak that uh, rather uh, public opinion, rather markets, and even COVID situation is driving ESG initiatives. Because being a lawyer, I know that there are 220 ways to go around law and regulations. We know that uh, international conventions, climate change requirements, and all the other requirements were uh, not complied with by many countries, as long as the stakeholders do not accept them. So basically, it is very important, for example, for us, for emerging markets, to have stimulus to do EEG initiatives in our country. And I would say, while preparing to this conference, I was navigating through internet and uh, through our contacts and clients, and I can see that uh, a number of EU initiatives, even before they became compulsory in EU, they were implemented already by Ukrainian companies, not because they were required to do so, but because they will get competitive advantage in front of the competitors. They will get a better marketplace of their products. So they're doing that as a part of their social responsibility. That's really interesting. Thank you, Olga. I've got a quick question in, um, and this one's from Kenneth Chung at uh, M3. Kenneth, thanks very much for joining us. It's focused around on ESFT, do we know if there's any clarity on whether existing ESG building certifications, e.g. LEED, KFW, comply with the taxonomy? I'm afraid that's not a question for me, Kenneth, but I'm delighted that we have more experts here. Um, do, does, anybody want to, does anybody want to pick that up, that specific point? A certification is a, is a tool to compare sustainable standards um, 
and its certification has been around for a while now. So the EU taxonomy is a rather new tool and it's it's different. The EU taxonomy is a regulatory tool, whereas certification is um, is a market tool. So, um, but one can see, so, um, and Olga raised that before, it's all about harmonizing different standards, harmonizing certification scheme and harmonizing regulation. So, and I, I understand, so certification is still an important tool to measure sustainability, in particular when it comes to um, in-use schemes, which which um, measure the performance of, um, of, of building operations. And um, so what I understand now that all these certification schemes are well aware of the EU taxonomy and the legal development and they are trying to to adopt their schemes to also be in line with the certification uh, sorry with the regulation so that would be something very helpful because the as I said before the the regulation is such a broad scheme which needs to be specified and if certification schemes could prove themselves at being a tool to at least measure some parts of yeah, compliance with the re regulation, that would be extremely helpful and I think a good way forward. Okay, good. Um, and I wanted to pick up on um, on on some of the speed. In you know, Do you think, Carleen, that again, this regulation is going to be accelerating from this point forward, given the targets that governments particularly want to meet? Yes, I compared it interestingly with in South Africa, uh, quite a few years ago, they had already disclosure requirements um, in, um, in our uh, jurisdiction. And many times the investors or investment managers just apply the, the minimum that they have to do and then it stopped there, and um, the investment managers didn't move past that. Um, only the few, as Olga mentioned, that saw it as a um, as a competitive advantage, really, really took it further. But what the EU is doing correctly with with these regulations is then following up with metrics that that need to be uh, reported in the future. And it's good to make disclosures to start with, but then how do you prove that you're actually doing what you're disclosing? And that's the, the beneficial step that is following. And that will really force uh, the market to really move into that direction and to improve over time. And I see other uh, jurisdictions also, their regulations really looking at EU to, to take the lead. And once the niggles are, are sorted out with the EU regulations, those regulations will follow suit. But it's very important that it's followed up with reporting on what you are doing and to improve that over time, you can't just report the same things every year and think investors will be happy. Olga, obviously the title of the panel here is about how um, ESG regulation is, is impacting investment strategies. I suppose, what, what are you seeing in terms of investment strategies, both from, uh, I suppose, the more domestic investment side, but also those international investors or cross-border investors who, who, are, who are coming into Ukraine? And yes, uh, of course, international investors are the best ambassadors and uh, international consultants, like I believe we are, are uh, the best ambassadors of ESG strategies because uh, the situation is very simple. There are some requirements, progressive requirements over EU in South Africa and the United States. And whenever investor would like to invest in Ukraine, even financial institutions, they put these requirements over Ukrainian companies. So it becomes naturally part of the business environment. After that, it is implemented in Ukrainian laws. Uh, uh, it is inevitable to have uh, ESG regulations in Ukraine and all over the world. And it's very important, like we are raising with Christiana, with Kalian, this point that these regulations should be as clear as possible so that they are easily implemented in different legal and regulatory environment. You cannot just simply take it and put it somewhere else. You need to adopt it. And in order to adopt, it should be properly drafted. But anyway, I would like to add one point with respect to domestic situation. We were discussing it with you in real estate video recently. 
that <coughs> there are specifics on new markets. Uh, of course, not everyone wants to, to have additional uh, financial pressure over ESG uh, regulations, etc. And if we look even navigate through different practices, someone try somehow to avoid that. So uh, the way to promote that accept of uh, social responsibility of the owner of the company, of shareholders, there should be some advantages put in each territory for those who promoting ESG approach. And in Ukraine, I would like to share with you, it was uh, uh, recently a very interesting initiative was passed. It's the local so-called on investment nannies. Our president called it like that. He was now in politics before. So it's a tip and trick. So basically, if you invest in Ukraine right now, more than 20 million euro, and you follow ESG requirements that you create new jobs, over 80 new jobs you should create, you invest in infrastructure, you, uh, you do social infrastructure facilities like schools and everything else, you uh, do environmental support, you, you, you will be allowed to up to 30% compensation of your investment from the state. You can imagine it's roughly more than 6 million euro you can get compensated from Ukrainian state just because you follow the normal EG requirements. So I believe that such approaches, such stimulus would be quite a very good thing even to catch from Ukraine abroad. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that the, the um those kinds of initiatives which are building in the investment has to be connected with ESG, um, you know, related um, assets, I think, and, and developments is really interesting. I just wanted to pick up on um, with you, Christiana, on, you know, there's there's obviously the EU taxonomy, there's SFDR coming in. Um, what are the other key kind of elements of regulation to achieve the Paris targets if we're particularly looking at that aspect then investors need to be considering and need to be building into their their sort of you know investment strategy really it's you taxonomy it's a disclosure regulation and um it's just a one pillar of, of future European legislation as well. And these both regulations will also be further developed um, by delegated um, legislative acts. And this is all on a European level. But what we also see on a national level is that companies are implementing their own regulations to meet the Paris climate um, agreement targets. So it's about energy regu efficiency regulations. Uh, it's about the promoting the use of um, alternative of energy sources and so on and this makes it also rather complicated so because all this legislation is just happening now and so far it's not really harmonized and um, you asked it before so what you need to consider when you in investment processes and I think this regulation makes an it requires a change um, to the way we do um, real estate due diligences, for example. So, um, so far we've been only looking at the at the status quo and the legal regulation which is already in place when we when we do a legal financial or tax due diligence. And this needs to change because several of our clients have had some bad experience. One day after signing, they notice okay, a new law came into force, and we need to uh, yeah spend quite a substantial amount on capex measures to meet these new requirements for example to build a new facade or to put in an infrastructure for e-mobility so advisors need to consider also they need to anticipate um, future laws which makes it more more challenging right now Colleen, just in terms of you know with with people anticipating laws are there are there I guess, international comparisons that people can be looking at and going, OK, well, this country is leading a standard here. Therefore, actually, if we look at the route that we're traveling, we'll, we should really start considering these particular assets. These particular um, regulations might be coming in. Are there things like that which can help investors and occupiers and uh, and finance houses, I, I guess, look at the, look at what might be coming down the track. Yes, I think uh, it's important to keep in mind that the the whole point uh, behind it is the Paris Agreement and the big goal um, uh, by twenty fifty. And really, what the regulations are trying to do is is sort of nudge people in that direction, as I've done with listed companies already, with 
the TCFD and so on, um, the, the overarching idea is to move people towards improving the way we use our resources, be it uh, natural resources, human resources, and so on. And uh, that is definitely a trend globally coming through. It's, it's not just in the EU. It, there is a uh, um, regulation out for consultation in Hong Kong and the U US is showing big um, uh, movements in, in that direction. So it's a global movement. And I think the EU has taken a uh, first step and, and um, people will be looking at the EU to see how these regulations develop out amends over time um, as, as definitions are defined better and, and things are basically taking a test run. But it's definitely something that will uh, in the next few years, there will be regulations in, in all jurisdictions. Um, and it is, the, the, the big thing is to just remember the whole point of all these regulations is not to, to make everyone work harder, it's really to attain a, a very big goal, a, a international goal, that if each of us do our, our part, that we will, we will reach that goal. Interesting question come in as well um, on uh, NZEB. Um, do you think that NZ will be sufficient or should we go further uh, in terms of the other regulations at the same time uh, as, as having that taxonomy? NZ, if, if I'm right, um, is the nearly zero energy buildings um, kind of regulations. Um, I don't know whether anybody's got a view on, on that particularly, Christiana, or whether that's a, a comeback to. Net zero and, and all these aspects are the main part when we talk about ESG right now. But um, yeah, as you heard on the other panels, and it's also my personal point of view, ESG is much more than just climate. So I think it's it's more also about the social, the governance factors, and also the other environmental target, which I mentioned um, about the EU taxonomy. So maybe adding to the EU taxonomy, it's the EU taxonomy also contains minimum standards from a social point of view. So this is something um, which also needs to be considered and is also driven by legislation. So I think the net zero legislation is an important part, but it's not the full picture. From a legal perspective, um, Christiana, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, drafting contracts and those kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, are, are there particular things that either the regulations that have just come in have changed in terms of um, drafting those for transactions or, or asset management, anything that people need to be considering? Some key points you need be considered. So first of all, we also discussed it today. It's about you're yeah, working in interdisciplinary teams, um, implementing the strategy and in, into all the different teams. So it's about creating a common understanding. So that's really, really important so that it's precise and it's clear to anybody signing the contract what's actually meant there. Um, then it's about we, we the disclosure regulation, Colleen said it, it's about reporting transparency. It's, so it's about data exchange clauses in all the agreements. And when you have long-term agreements, it's about flexibility because the market will develop and the regulation will develop. And then it's very important that you at least have, have a basis to, to adjust the agreements there as well. And then it's about yeah putting the risk management point of view in there. And I think Carleen was the one who said it about it's about quality improvement in the end to have yeah higher quality buildings in the end. So this needs to be reflected, for example, in warranty schemes there as well. You know, if we're looking at this again in six months, twelve months time, how do we see this changing? Do we see this continued acceleration? What's your sense? Let's let's start with you, Colleen. Well, I think if you want to really push the ESG agenda and and have funds that uh, are ESG funds, you must realize there's two big elements related to that and that's your investment strategy. You you won't necessarily get there if your investment strategy or your strategy to get there isn't in place. Um, and then the other thing is then the reporting and the data. You need data in order to report on it. So uh, as Christiana mentioned, you need to get hold of that data, report on that, and then improve that data over time. So a really big focus on um, improving what we are currently disclosing and then improving um, using that data to improve the funds to to improve returns as well. Okay, super. Olga? No, I think we discussed already this issue during the markets and valuation sessions. It's, uh, these are invitable uh, changes. 
and uh, they will become stronger and harder ESG requirements on paper in regulations and also with respect to public requirements into these. It's, it was strange, but even in Ukraine, you, according to the last uh, poll which we had, over 35% of Ukrainians are paying attention to the sustainability requirement by product is produced. So it's about like 12 million people are doing that. So now I think here uh, we need to advise the client and everyone who is doing business. Those who would take advantage, who would implement ESG strategies and improve reporting first because they will have competitive positions on the market and they will follow the laws and avoid negative consequences. Okay. Okay, super. And last word to you, Christiana. I think it will still accelerate, and but in six months' time, I think we will be a big step further. So we will have more data, as Colleen said. And then um, we heard it in a market session. So we see it from an occupier side occupier side here as well so and i think in six months time so there will be we will know so much more about the occupiers um so and it's interesting to see how how their strategies and the the landlord strategies will come together to make make an, a completely new and holistic strategy for the for the real estate. Great, thanks very much. Really interesting, really interesting panel. Um, and interesting to see how these regulations will really begin to affect um, particularly investment strategy going forward. Thanks very much for joining this panel. Thank you to the speakers and uh, look forward to seeing you for the tax panel. Thanks very much, everybody.